Historically, in the doctrine of anthropology, the fact that we are created in the image of God, as a part of that image of God is male-female, and now uh, we're talking about male-female roles in society, we now uh, come to what does the Bible teach about man and woman, or, or mankind as male and female. And uh, what I'm going to do uh, right now is I'm going to have you look at page 110. Uh, and this would be the page that I would, I would encourage you to think about, read it carefully, because there are three views on male-female roles. There's the old hierarchical view that man is at the top of the chain and that he dictates policy to the woman who's at the bottom of the chain and that the woman must obey and be basically a doormat to the man. Am I prejudicing that view enough uh, or do I need to say it more? Okay. I, obviously, I don't follow the hierarchical view, uh, but it is the one that sees a highly structural authority. Uh, are any of you familiar with the Institute in Basic Youth Conflict, more commonly called the Bill Gothard Institute? If you've ever been to a Bill Gothard Institute, he embraces and draws the diagram of the chain of command. That's the hierarchical view of male-female relationships. I understand the view. I have a small infinitesimally small respect for the view, uh, but I don't embrace that view. I think the only two options that you have are egalitarian and complementarian. Uh, egalitarian view is that view of male-female relationships that emphasize equality of personhood. There are no substantive differences between uh, man and woman. Uh, it emphasizes mutual submission but sees no subordination of the wife to the husband or any kind of subordination within the church family as well. And so it's the idea of pure, complete equality across the board. Everybody is equal, uh, and we all practice mutual submission. I think there are some truths to that. I personally don't embrace it, though I tried to uh, a number of years ago. Uh, I've come to the view known as the complementarian because I think it has the most biblical support. And that's the view of male-female relationships in marriage that emphasize both the equality of personhood due to creation as well as differentiation of roles. Uh, man has a different role than the woman in the marriage relationship. If you go into the, uh, into the church, man has a, uh, some different roles from a woman within the church as well. Turn the page to 112 before we go any further. I want you to see uh, what we mean by the complementarian view uh, just for, for clarity's sake. We, we apply the complementarian view to the individual, the family, and the church. For the individual, this means equality of personhood. You are created in the image of God. I am created in the image of God. Your image is not better than my image. Uh, I may behave far away from my image. Uh, you may behave far away from your image. But the fact that we are both still created, though marred, though distorted though tarnished, we are both equally in the image of God, gives us both what we call derived majesty or dignity. Dignity on, the, on account of creation. That's the equality of personhood. Uh, that's why our forefathers, in writing our Constitution, would say things like that all men are created equal. But, but that phrase alone has to be qualified, which the Constitution doesn't qualify. You and I are not equal. Some of you are smarter than I am. Some of you are taller than I am. Some of you are prettier than I am. Uh, and so forth. And you're saying, well, hey, we knew all this. Well, just work with me on this. We're, we're not created in, in those things. Uh, has it ever occurred to you that, that God must take pleasure in differences of IQ, in differences of sizes? in differences of skin color, in all kinds. Of, he celebrates difference, but in equality of personhood, of inner personhood, we're all created equal. But we have different gifts, we have different abil abilities, we have different, different talents, and so forth as individuals. When we come to our family, our nuclear family, you have equality of personhood. Uh, Carolyn and I are equal in personhood. And Mindy is equal in person. And Chris, when he was with us, was equal in personhood. But we didn't all have the same role. 
Chris's role was to mow the yard when I could get him out there to do it. Uh, Mindy's role was to whine and complain about how things were going. <laughs> Everybody had a role to play uh, within the family. But yet we were all equal in our majesty, derived majesty, our dignity, our personhood, but we had different roles in the family. That's why the scripture can say, children, obey your parents and the Lord, and so forth and so on. In the church, there's equality of personhood. On the basis of Galatians chapter 3, a salvation passage says that, that because we are now in Christ, rightly related with God in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. There are no distinctions within the family of God. We are, have equality of personhood, but within the church, we're all equally saved, in other words, but within the church, some of us have different roles. Those roles may be dictated by uh, spiritual gifting, or it may be dictated by biblical uh, command or biblical restrictions. That's what the complementarian view is saying. If you were doing a diagram for the egalitarian view, you, would, you, would, uh, you could erase all of the, the lower sections and just leave it equality of personhood, equality of personhood, equality of personhood, and with that, equality of opportunity for all. That's what the egalitarian view would basically say. Now, in this particular workbook, you'll have to uh, bear with me. I, I follow through the equality of, uh, or the, the uh, complementarian view. And I'm not going to go through it uh, step by step because I think you can read it and see it. But what we, under, what we uh, document in here is, is that there can be equality of personhood both before the fall as well as after the fall that there is differentiation of roles before the fall as well as after the fall. Uh, and you uh, gather those from Scripture. Uh, turn to page 121. Since I'm going to leave you to do uh, that study, I want to end up on the last little discussion before we go to next week, which is the doctrine of sin and how that has messed up everything. We have uh, the fall of mankind. That is basically... Uh, the description of the fall of Adam and Eve from the state of innocence into sin. I want you to notice and I want you to indicate somewhere in your notes that Genesis 3 does not describe the origin of sin. Sin does not start in Genesis 3. Why? Because you already have a creature tempting man to sin. The tempter had his own fall prior to the fall of man. So the origin of sin in universal reality comes through the rebellion of Lucifer or the rebellion of Satan and the one-third of the angels that followed his insane rebellion. And on the basis of that rebellion, which must have occurred before Genesis 3, somewhere uh, before that, we now have the tempter working through the serpent in order to tempt the innocent man and woman to act independently of God. Uh, man and woman were placed in the garden. Now, I want us to just simply look at the observations. I'll stop, and then we'll take, uh, we'll take some time for some questions. Here's our observations. You're familiar with the story. The serpent, according to Revelation 12 and 20, he was Satan, he's working behind the serpent, was a fallen creature prior to man's fall. B, the serpent slyly challenged God's word and his right to rule. When God says, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that is the probationary test whereby had Adam and Eve passed the probationary test and been fully obedient to God's revealed will, which comes out of God's holy character and nature. Had man done so, then God would have confirmed his righteousness and there would have been no fall and things would have gone wonderfully. But it didn't happen that way. So what we understand is the serpent slyly, subtly, is challenging God's word and his right to rule. Point C. The serpent caused the woman to doubt God's word and God's goodness. Did God really say that? Oh, he knows that you'll be like him. I can't believe he would say that. Uh, point D. The woman was the initial focus of Satan's attack strategy. She distorted the prohibition. Uh, the prohibition in Genesis 2 was not eat of the tree. By the time she's talking to the serpent, it's don't touch it or eat. All right? Point E. Satan used subtle questions and half-truths 
to deceive the woman. Point F. So used a temptation strategy with the woman that was repeated with Christ. If you want to go to uh, Luke 4 or Matthew 4, you'll find that the three temptations of Jesus line up beautifully with the, three, uh, the, the, uh, the appeal to the woman, uh, desirable to make wise, appealing to the eyes, and so forth, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life, uh, the, the temptation of Christ, and then also 1 John 2, 15 to 17, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life, so forth. All of that temptation strategy was used with the first man and the woman, was used with Jesus, and it's being used on Christians today. Uh, when he's got something that works, he doesn't deviate. He just keeps working the plan. Point G, the woman's sin was a lack of faith in God's perfect provision and personal obedience to His will. By this act of the two humans, sin entered into the human predicament. We all know that the text says very cle clearly, the woman in dialogue with the serpent took the fruit, ate, and gave to her husband who was with her, I suggest through the whole dialogue, and the man ate. Now, if you're complementarian, what you see is that Adam is the federal representative head. Adam, standing there listening to this conversation, should have said, just a minute, Eve, hold on. Uh, let me get a stick. And he should have taken a stick and beat the fire out of the snake. Pushed her out because he is the federal head. He is responsible for them. She was created as a helper. He was the one who named her and named the animals. He has, according to the New Testament, uh, a position based on prior creation order and all of that. He is to be the head of the woman as Christ is the head of the church, as God is the head of Christ, that he should have stepped forward and done what a leader should have done. But what he did not do is, she is being deceived. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's going to sin willfully. And therefore, I'm not surprised, nor are, are, are uh, certain theologians surprised, that when we get to the New Testament, we find out that Adam is the one who's held culpable for the sin when all of us men would like to say, well, if Eve hadn't been talking to the servant, we'd never be in this spot. Well, you were sitting there watching it. Why didn't you step forward? And so consequently, as a result of that, we have the woman deceived, last point, the man sins willfully. Now you run to Romans 5 and figure out what that means for all of humanity. And we get to that as we come to sin in our next session. Father, now we thank you for the goodness of life. We thank you that you are a creator that that uh, loves us in spite of our sin and rebellion, and we desire to walk with you. And that is our sanest, most, uh, uh, most perfect response. Dismiss us now with a sense of your presence, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.